to take you to the, probably the theme verse. What is Leviticus about? Let me just read the theme verse. Leviticus chapter 20, I'll just read verse 26. This is what Moses writes. <clears throat> this is a direct command from God. You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy. And I have separated you from the peoples that you will be mine. Let's pray and ask God to bless our time. Father, thank you for the word. Thank you for Leviticus. Pray that you speak to us and help us. God, teach us what it means to be holy, and Lord, give us a, a deeper understanding of your holiness. And so, Lord, I, I need your help to teach properly tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So, if Exodus tells you where the Lord is to be worshipped, then the book of Leviticus tells you how God is to be worshipped. If you follow the storyline in Genesis and you get to Exodus and we come out of Egypt and the people cross the Red Sea, they get into the wilderness, go to Mount Sinai, and God gives the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, Exodus 20. And thereafter giving the Ten Commandments, if you go from Exodus 20 to Exodus 40, in that region, that's where the book of Leviticus shows up. You read Leviticus, there's not really a storyline in Leviticus. Uh, one of the fun things about preaching the book of Joshua is that there's a storyline. I can hang the truth on a story. It's easier to bring that in front of people. If you're teaching, you, you know that if you have a story to hang things on, truth on the story, then you can get through it. Leviticus, there's no story. There is a couple of stories. There's one of Nadab and Abihu in chapter 10. They're struck down because they had strange fire. But well, that's not really a great story to teach on. Or there's another story where there was a fight and one man cursed the name of God as he was fighting and he was struck down. Those are the only two stories. And that's not what you teach in Sunday school to seven-year-olds out of Leviticus. <laughs> but Leviticus is really... Did you know that Leviticus, um, the most famous, one of the most famous icons for America has a verse from Leviticus, the Liberty Bell. Do you know that the Liberty Bell is named the Liberty Bell because of Leviticus chapter 25, verse 10? You can look at it if you'd like to. Let's look at it. Chapter 25, verse 10. The Liberty Bell in Philadelphia. You shall consecrate the, the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land and to all of its inhabitants. The fathers of the country thought, that's a good verse. Let's put it on a bell. There it is. The Liberty Bell is named after Leviticus 25, verse 10. If you were to take, if you were to take uh, Leviticus and sit down with it and start in chapter 1 and read through to chapter 27, it probably would take you about three hours to read the book of Leviticus. If you just read it all the way through at a normal pace, about three hours to get through the book of Leviticus. Now, when you think about where does the title come from, Leviticus? Well, in Hebrew, most of the time, the, the Pentateuch, their titles are going to be right from the very beginning. So if you flip back to Leviticus chapter 1, and in Hebrew, the title was The Lord Called. That was the title, The Lord Called. That was the title in Hebrew, picked it up in, in Greek, uh, the Hebrew was Vakira, I think is how you said it. Yeah, Vakira, that was Hebrew. Uh, the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, that's probably the Bible that Jesus would have used, the Septuagint. Uh, in Greek, it was Luteon. That Greek was translated into Latin. Latin give, gives us the name Leviticus, the study of the tribe of Levi, which is something because... You have the Levites mentioned one time in Leviticus. And sometimes it's misunderstood when you read this book. This is about the Old Testament priest. And, and, and yes, it is, but so much more. If you take Leviticus 1, if you take Leviticus verse 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, and then the very last verse of the book, 
chapter 27, verse 34, uh, they say the same thing, that the Lord called Moses and He spoke to him from the tent of the meeting. That God speaks. Leviticus 1, 1 is God speaks. Leviticus 27, God speaks. Do you know that if you were to read Leviticus, <clears throat> there is more direct word from God in the book of Leviticus than in any other book in the entire Bible. Here are the instructions that God gave Moses to give to the people when they were encamped there at the bottom of Sinai. And Exodus closes out in Exodus chapter 40 when the tabernacle, there in the tabernacle, in chapter 40, verse 38. You can just look to the left across the page. The cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, the fire was in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all of their journeys. And if you just keep coming over to Leviticus 1. And the Lord called to Moses and He spoke to him from that tabernacle. And that's when God gives instructions, not just where to worship, but this is how. How do you worship? As we think about this tonight, there are a couple of things to remember God's people are God's people are distinct. I mean, isn't that the theme verse that I gave you? You probably have it on your, your, your sheet of paper. That, that we are to be different. We are to be holy. We're set apart because God is holy. And then that, that chapter and verse says that, that God is holy, you are to be holy, and you are mine. If that's the case, we not only worship a holy God, we have to live holy lives. So some of you like an outline, if you wanted to outline the book, it's 27 chapters. And if you were to go through it, you'd find out uh, when you get to verse, from chapters, chapter 1 to verse 7, you have uh, the sacrifices. There are five offerings. They have the sacrifices to make from chapter 1 to chapter 7, sacrifices the people must make. If you get to chapter 8, 9, and 10, that's in the middle, just three chapters, in chapters 8, 9, and 10, you have the preparation of Aaron to be the high priest for the people. And then after chapter 10, you have chapters 11 through 15. You have all the purity laws. This is where if you ever go through a Bible plan, you're reading, this is where you get bogged down. You're reading the purity laws and you roll up on what to do if you've got a, some sort of boil that comes up and it's white and, and you're clean and unclean. It's really terrible. It's not very good for a quiet time. You're reading it and thinking, this is how, what do I get out of this? But what it is, is it's showing you the purity. So you have chapter 11 to 15, the purity laws. And then chapter 16 is like um, this bright light in Leviticus. Chapter 16, you have the Day of Atonement, this great foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. You have there the mention of the scapegoat. It's where we get the, the, the word scapegoat comes out of Leviticus chapter 16. And then chapter 17 to chapter 27, you have just various laws about holiness. Holiness. If there is a word that runs through Leviticus, maybe this is why it's not preached very much, it's the word holiness. A holy God, that's what we believe. A holy God calls for a distinct. You go through the chapters, you start it out, and it begins in chapter 1, and there you have the call for the priest. The priest's got to be distinct. In fact, let me, let's just go to the one story that's in it, chapter 10. Just a couple of pages over. Go to chapter 10. Let's take a look at Nadab and Abihu. These are Aaron's son. Aaron is the high priest. His sons are going to be priests. They've, they've been brought into the priesthood. Let me just... Um, let me just read this. Start in chapter 10, verse 1. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, they each took his censer, they put fire in it, and laid incense on it, and they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And the fire came out before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified, and before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Moses called Mishael and 
Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, so these are Nadab and Abihu's cousins, said to them, come, and come near, carry your brothers away from the front of the sanctuary and out of the camp. So they came near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said to Aaron and to Eliezer and Ithamar his sons, do not let the hair of your heads hang loose. Do not tear your clothes, lest you die. Wrath come upon all the congregation, but let your brothers, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning that the Lord has kindled. And here's this story. It's, it's stark. It doesn't, I mean, for, for our own minds, especially our Western minds and our understanding of fairness, it doesn't seem right, especially when we hear and think about the, the, the God we know, the Bible, the God of love. But what we sometimes forget that the talk so much about God's attributes clouds the prevailing character of God, that He's holy. And the Levites, or let's just say the priests, they had to be ceremonially clean. They had to be physically whole. They had to have obedient children. If they were going to be leaders uh, for a holy God, for the congregation, they had to be different. They had special duties. When you read uh, uh, Leviticus, you find out they had certain things they had to do for themselves. Leviticus 10, um, since we're there, they also taught. One of the things you don't think about when you think about an Old Testament priest is you think about offering sacrifices. But what they also were responsible for was teaching. Let me call your attention to chapter 10, verse 10. You are to distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean, and you are to teach the people of Israel all the statutes that the Lord has spoken to them by Moses. So it's not just doing sacrifices for uh, the temple and the tabernacle, which would become the temple. They were to actually teach. What do these things mean? And, and with that came a special judgment. They were to be judged even higher than other people. But it's not just um, the priest, it's God's people. God's people, Leviticus teaches that God's people must be distinct. There's another story, let me uh, just keep flipping over. I told you, uh, going through Leviticus, Leviticus is going to feel a little bit like Bible drill, because I want you flipping here and there. But just go to chapter 24, near the end of the book. Chapter 24, and I'll, let's go down to verse 10. And so I, told, I gave you one story, Nadab and Abihu. Here's the only other story in the entire book of Leviticus. It's chapter 24. Neither of these stories have happy endings, by the way. So here's the story, verse 10. <clears throat> Now an Israelite woman's son, an Israelite woman's son, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the people of Israel, and the Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel fought in the camp. So a fist fight breaks out. And the Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name, the tetragrammaton, the, the unspeakable name, the name Yahweh, and cursed. They brought him to Moses. His mother's name was Shelemith the daughter of Debri, of the tribe of Dan. They put him in custody to the will of the Lord should be clear to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. So let me just stop here. Like 40 times in the book of Leviticus, the Lord spoke. I was reading a commentary um, from Andrew Bonar. Andrew Bonar wrote the biography of Robert Murray McShane. That's the reading plan we use sometimes. The pastor was 29 years old and he died in Scotland early 1800s, Andrew Bonar says that um, he, Leviticus has the most direct line of God speaking to people. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Bring out of the camp the one who cursed, let all who heard him, look at the association, lay their hands on his head, let all the congregation stone him, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. 
and all the congregation shall stone him, the sojourner as well as the, as well as the native, when he blasphemes, the name shall be put to death. I mean, that, we've just had two stories, both of which deal with sin being handled immediately by death. It should bring up in our minds, Romans, the wages of sin is death. When you read Leviticus, you'll see the word clean and unclean. Do you know that uh, out of all the Bible, 66 books, half of the uses of the word unclean are in the book of Leviticus. If you had COVID, you know what it feels like to feel unclean. And my wife had it, and so I felt like I had to be confined, and so we both were like, we don't want to see anybody, unclean. There's nothing moral or amoral about clean and unclean. That, there's nothing moral there. The morality shows up with holy and unholy. What do we learn here? Well, a couple of things that I think we do learn. Uh, one thing we learn is that, that, that God is indifferent about nothing. There is nothing in our lives that God is indifferent about. We tend to think of in, in vagaries, in, 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 in broad things, a pretty good guy, a, 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 a pretty nice lady, um, fairly moral. There's nothing, private, public, that God is indifferent about. Or another way to say it, you might write it like this, is that everything matters to God, everything. Sometimes you might tend to think that God is not concerned about the small things or the little decisions you make, or He's not concerned. When you read Leviticus, what you find out is all of these minuscule and obscure laws, it, it reminds us that everything matters to God. And I would, I would press it a little further, that every day, every day matters and has eternal importance to God. And let's press further for Christians now when it comes to worship. <clears throat> that when you read Leviticus, because that's what this is about, it's about God's holiness and the problem. There's a problem with God's holiness. It's our sinfulness. And Leviticus solves the problem of how a holy God will actually tolerate His people. Now we see flashes of it breaking out with Nadab and Abihu the story in, in, in chapter 24. But Leviticus solves the problem. How can God dwell with His people? Because His presence is there, the tabernacle, He's led His people out, but they're sinful. And so what Leviticus does is gives us the means of worship. This is how God... This is why Levitic, Leviticus is so important to the gospel because it becomes the framework for how we understand the gospel. I mean, when you, when, you, uh, when you read it and you get into chapter 17 and 18, that God cares tremendously about how He's worshipped. He's, he cares that His people are different from those around Him, uh, who, uh, around them. The, the people, the Canaanites would have fertility rites, uh, cult prostitution, child sacrifice, divination, uh, necromancy, um, worshipping the dead, uh, you can even see some of that like with uh, Saul and uh, Samuel with the witch of Endor. So, so you, the people around Israel, they, they didn't worship like Israel did. And God had real concern, cared tremendously. Like chapter 19 of Leviticus 19, 20 or 28. Leviticus 19, 28 uh, is used by a lot of people to say if you get a tattoo, it's sinful. Because, let me just read it to you. 19.28 or so. You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourself, I am the Lord. So I've seen people take that out and say, okay, that's it's a sin then to get a tattoo. Well, I'll tell you what, let's do it. Let's take that verse and put it into its context. And the context is... The Canaanite religions around you, they were into self-mutilation, and part of that mutilation was tattooing, and it was a sign that you were part of a pagan group. So, so, so what God is saying is, don't do that. I, I want you holy, so that when people look at you, they see you're, 
you're different. That's not a good text to use for not getting a tattoo. Because it has to do with, with religion. We're, we're taught here in Leviticus, I think it's important because that we're, we're taught that every phase of life should be lived in a way that pleases God. What, I mean, the theme of it. In fact, you press it a little further, then you read it, you see that holiness is the dominant character of God. Something that needs to be brought back into, or not brought back, maybe just brought into the church, is that when we think of our God, we think of that most people will think of love being the dominant character of God. I have that in the New Testament, God is love. It does say that. But when you read the Bible in its totality, what you find out, and Leviticus points it out, puts a spotlight on it, that holiness is the dominant character of God. Some of you know the Bible well enough that Isaiah chapter 6, when, when Isaiah has the vision uh, and he sees the Lord sitting on the throne in the temple and the seraphim are flying, do you remember what the seraphim are saying? Okay. Three times. Holy, holy, holy. So, so holiness magnified. Two times is a lot in the Bible. Three times is this showing that this is the dominating feature of who God is. And Leviticus brings that to bear. And, and not just the holiness of God, but what's important for us is that now Leviticus shows that God has concern not just for His own holiness, because He'll talk about His name being holy. He has concern for the holiness of His people. I, you know what, let's just flip through the Bible a couple of uh, spots and just, um, let's just take a look at some of the concern for holiness. Let's go back to chapter 17. Chapter 17, verse 7. They will no more sacrifice their sacrifices to goat demons. Remember I talked about the pagan pagans around them? No more sacrifice the sacrifices to goat demons after whom they whore. This shall be a statute forever for them through their generations. They are to be different. Come to chapter 18, verse 21. You shall not give any of your children to offer them to Moloch, and so profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. Moloch was the god of fire. Part of it was child sacrifice. Chapter 19, verse 4. Do not turn to idols or make for yourself any gods of cast metal. I am the Lord your God. Chapter 19, verse 26. You shall not eat any flesh with the blood in it. You shall not interpret omens or tell fortune, fortunes, witchcraft. Chapter 19, verse 31. Do not turn to mediums or necromancers. Do not seek them out. And so make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. Right, look at that other verse right there. Uh, verse 32. You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man, and you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. It's, isn't it interesting that that is stuck right in there, dealing with paganism, idol worship, and... Showing honor to whom honor is due. You know that Leviticus 19, if you were to take it, uh, Leviticus 19 verse 18 has the verse that Jesus himself quoted more than any other verse. Let me take you to it. Chapter 19 verse 18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The golden rule comes from Leviticus 19. Holiness. So then how do we take hold of the holiness of God and the expectations of holiness to us? How, how is holiness seen? Well, holiness is seen in obedience. Let me... Um, what does obedience do for us? When you obey God and know the things that you're called to do, th those of you here, most of you are walking with the Lord in some capacity. You've been following Christ. You're, you're at least acquainted with the Bible or reading it. What does obedience mean? Well, I'll give you one thing. Obedience is going to mean in your life there is prospering. Prospering. 
I had a hard time writing that down because I hate the prosperity gospel. I think it's a false gospel and it sends people to hell. I think that it's propagated throughout uh, poor regions of the world and is, is terrible. The prosperity gospel breaks down when you're in trouble, when you're hurt. But, but there is a sense where obedience to God leads to human flourishing. Let me give you a couple of verses to show that to you. Uh, let's go to Leviticus chapter... I'll just take it near the end. Leviticus 26. I'll start in verse 3. Leviticus 26, verse 3. Let's just, let me just read a little bit. I'll just come down the page. This is, now remember, this is God speaking. So, that's, so what's so beautiful about Leviticus is the actual words of God direct command. So when we read uh, Ephesians or Philippians, you're having, uh, Paul has written, and we take that as God's word. But here in Leviticus, you have this, it, it's clearly God's co command. So, for instance, let me read it for you. If you walk in my statutes and you observe my commands and you do them, if you'll do that, I will give you your rains in their season, their land shall yield its increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last at the time of the grape harvest. The grape harvest shall last at the time of the sowing. You shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land securely. I will give peace in the land. You shall lie down and no one will make you afraid. I will remove harmful beasts from the... I mean, it just goes on and on. You can read it all the way to the, to the end of about verse 13. And it's nothing but God saying, if you are obedient, there's flourishing. One of the great reminders of following Christ is that we do follow, and certainly there are hard times, but, but an obedient person has God's promise of human flourishing. Another one is if you, you obey, and, and God promises to be with us. I'll just take you to 26 since we're there, verse 11 and 12. And this is what the Lord says, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not abhor you, and I will walk among you. I will be your God, and you will be my people. What a wonderful promise when you are seeking to honor God, being obedient in your life, that God promises flourishing, but, but not just that, the fellowship, that God will be close to you and with you. We obey Him. Um, we will obey Him because not only He promises to be with us, we obey Him because we fear Him. We should fear Him. I'll show you a couple of reasons. Leviticus is full of all kinds of reasons to fear God. Uh, Leviticus 25, let's go to verse 17 or so. Or, or so. Yeah, verse 17. You shall not wrong one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. Or verse 25, verse 36. Take no interest in him for profit, but fear your God, that your brother may live beside you. Or down to verse 43. You shall not rule over him ruthlessly, fear your God. There's, there's one verse, I can't find it right now, where you don't, you don't shout at a deaf person because you fear God. And although the deaf person didn't hear you, God heard it. There, there's this understanding that we are obedient to God. Sometimes it's good to be reminded that our God is a consuming fire and is to be feared. We obey out of fear. We, um, we should obey to reflect God's character. When you can read it over and over. If you get a chapter, um, Leviticus chapter 19, I would just take Leviticus 19. You can go down it. I won't read it all. Fourteen times in Leviticus 19, he gives a command, and then he says, because I am the Lord. One of the reasons we obey God is our obedience. Your obedience in, in, in hard situations or good situations, your obedience is a reflection of the God that you serve. We obey God and get to chapter 20. We obey God because that becomes a witness. So we have, um, I've gone through holiness, holiness being the dominant character of God. His priests are holy, the people are holy. Let me give you, um, I think the third point 
is that God's people, Leviticus put the framework, God's people are sinful and need atonement. Let's set it up. This is where Leviticus comes to play into the New Testament. So, flip back with me to Leviticus chapter 9. In Leviticus 9, we find out in about verse 22, here comes the problem. God is holy, we are sinners, and yet God desires to be with His people. Leviticus solves the problem, at least temporarily. If we start in verse 22. Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people, and he blessed them. And he came down from offering the sin offering, and the burnt offering, and the peace offering. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. And when they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came out from before the Lord, and consumed the burnt offering, and the pieces of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted, and they fell on their faces. So, so you keep going through Leviticus, you find out over and over again, sin brings death. If you get to Leviticus 17, sin brings death. Or Leviticus 4 uh, shows us how that sin brings death, and that death of the, of the object brings peace. Um, let, me, let me show you what I mean. Leviticus 4, back up just a little bit. Leviticus 4.13, uh, I'm going to read something here. And Leviticus is filled with sins that are unintentional. Most of the time we think if the intent is okay, then the person's okay. If he, has, he, he does, he'll do a dumb thing that has good intention, has good heart, we sometimes say that. That's not what the Leviticus says. Leviticus says you actually can sin unintentionally. Let me show it to you in verse 13. If the, whole congregation, if the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally, and the thing is hidden from the eyes of the assembly, and they do any one of the things that by the Lord's commandment ought not to be done, and they realize their guilt, when the sin which they have committed becomes known, the assembly shall offer a bull from the herd for a sin offering, bring it in front of the tent of meeting, and the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands on the head of the bull before the Lord, and the bull shall be killed before the Lord. So stop there. Here is the framework right here for substitutionary atonement. The idea, and that's, that is a key for being a Christian, the idea is that a sinner comes and puts her hand or his hand on the head of a substitute. This is a bull. And that bull or that lamb will be killed. And the blood taken away from it. The sin is transfer transferred from the sinner to the bull and the price is paid. There's the picture of substitutionary Atonement. An animal dying in the place of a sinner. And you, when, you read, uh, when you read Hebrews, uh, not Hebrews, when you read Leviticus, um, you, you find there are five major offerings in Leviticus. So you have the burnt offering. The grain, did I have this on your sheet? I don't know if I'll put this down there. A burnt offering, a grain offering, peace offering, sin offering, guilt offering. Let me go through them again. Burnt offering, Leviticus 1, 1 through 4. A grain offering, Leviticus 2, 1 through 3. A peace offering, Leviticus 3, 1 through 5. A sin offering, Leviticus 4, 1 through 12. A guilt offering, Leviticus 5, 14 through 16. So why do we have all of those offerings? A constant reminder that there, that there must be some transaction for this holy God to be close to sinful people. There must be something that brings the old English word atonement, at one minute. There must be something that brings reconciliation. 
So with that framework, let's go quickly and see how does Leviticus play into the New Testament. Let's go to the New Testament. Let me just kind of walk you through a couple of things. Well, we've already uh, mentioned Leviticus 19, 18. That is the golden rule. The very, uh, the most, the thing that Jesus quoted the most was in Leviticus. Matthew 19, 19 is a place. Uh, when Peter writes his uh, letter, 1 Peter, you'll find that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, he speaks of separation and holy, being that, that God's people are to be holy and separated. If you, you can find it if you like, I, I'll... Uh, I'll go quickly through. I'll just give you the references. Uh, 1 Peter, uh, Peter speaks of being holy and separated. 1 Peter 1, verse 15, he talks about daily holiness. He gets that idea out of the book of Leviticus. In your New Testament, if you open up to the book of Hebrews, you know, when Connie was sick, I, I was reading to her. Uh, I started reading some Charles Spurgeon sermons. Actually, one. It took me 40, almost 50 minutes to get through one. And so I so, said, well, I'll try some Puritans. So then I went to uh, Puritans. I read John Flavel. That was really good. And uh, I, I posted that on social media, and someone said, shouldn't you be reading some romance novels to her? <laughs> well, we were fresh out. There was nothing like that in the house. And so I was reading the Puritans. And uh, one day, I, you know, I was out there a little early because uh, she was out on the porch, and um, so I have this reader's Bible. It doesn't have any chapters or verses. So I'm reading it. And I get to the book of Hebrews and she was like, well, why don't you just read, you know, you're doing your devotion, just read that to me. So we sat and I went through, read the entire book of Hebrews. Right there, just read it to her. And um, I had been given some thought to preaching Hebrews in 2022 until I read it again. <laughs> it really hard to get through. But you know, the, he the book of Hebrews is a commentary on the book of Leviticus. Hebrews becomes the unfolding and the unwrapping and the, the revealing of everything that Leviticus foreshadows. The book of Hebrews then gives us all of the answers. In fact, if you get the, if you get the Leviticus chapter 16, uh, you take Leviticus 16 and you have the Day of Atonement, the Yom Kippur, that is the day when when all of the sin is forgiven there and you have one goat is slain and then one is cast into the wilderness called the scapegoat. And the writer of Hebrews picks up in Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10 and explains that the atoning work of Jesus. The writer says, this is what Jesus, once and for all, has done for us. So, so Leviticus becomes the very ground that the New Testament stands on. Without Leviticus, the New Testament doesn't make any sense. Without Leviticus, the, Jesus dying on the cross in the place of sinners doesn't make sense. Without Leviticus, the substitutionary death of a sacrificial lamb doesn't make sense. The, the songs we sing about the Lamb of God slain, they don't make any sense without Leviticus. You read... Um, Read the New Testament and you find out that, that the death of Jesus fulfilled the Levitical concept of the sin offering. Have all of those offerings and the death of Jesus fulfilled all of it. In Romans, do you know Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4? Romans chapter 8, verse 1 through 4. Paul writes, and this is why he can write it, he's a good Jew. There is, no, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set us free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done, he's talking about Leviticus, God has done what the law couldn't do. You'll, you'll find it again in Hebrews chapter 10. You'll find it again in, 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 in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where, where the, the New Testament writers are taking their cue from the book of Leviticus saying, there's the problem, and God in His grace gave a solution that was temporary, and that temporary solution pointed to the eternal solution that is Jesus. 
Uh, Colossians 1, Paul writes in Colossians 1, 18, 19, and 20, that Jesus is the peace offering. The building of the tabernacle at Exodus 40, and then what you do in that tabernacle, uh, the priest in Leviticus is the foreshadowing of the work of Jesus. You get to, to Romans chapter 12, and, and, and Paul talks about being living sacrifices. It's because Jesus lives in believers through His one-time sacrifice that has its foundation in Leviticus. It's because He lives in believers that we actually can be Romans 12 living sacrifices. Okay, okay. So that's the New Testament. What then are the themes? If you read Leviticus, what do you find as the key themes? I'll give you just a, a couple of key themes. One theme is the... The Holy Lord, our Holy God, is present in the midst of His people, and because of that, sin must be dealt with. God is present with His people, and because He is present, sin must be dealt with. Sometimes we'll say God will not be present with people if they are sinful. I think it's good to say God is present with His people, and because He's present, sin either through death of the sinner or death of a substitute, must be dealt with. I'll give you another thought, Leviticus. Uh, you, you read Leviticus, there's a theme that reminds you that a, a, approaching God means wholehearted devotion. There is no flippancy in Leviticus. It's very serious. You know, one of the things we don't want to do is become so stilted that, and so formal that we miss the movement of God's Holy Spirit. But the other side of that coin is you don't want to become so flippant and casual and laid back that we forget who it is we're actually dealing with. One theme that runs through Leviticus is that the spiritual leaders, the priests, Nadab and Abihu, the spiritual leaders bear a heavier responsibility. You find that in the New Testament too. Another theme in Leviticus, uh, we're reminded that purification is impossible from the human side. We can't do anything. I mean, even the system given in Leviticus was given by God. It's direct revelation. Here's how you'll be able to get close to me. That points to, ultimately, to Christ. Uh, another theme that goes through Leviticus is that atonement. Atonement is a gracious act of the Lord Think about Jesus dying on the cross. Atonement is a gracious act of God where sins can be taken away. One of the great reminders for us as, as believers is that God forgives our sins through Jesus. One of the wonderful themes of being a Christian is God's grace. Okay, let me, uh, I'll, I'm going to end with four or five things. Try to end it a little uh a little sooner, I need to have a, a business meeting, so let me just end with four or five things. Why is Leviticus important to you? Why is it important? Here's the first one. If you're going to know the Bible, you're going to know the Jewish people, Leviticus describes the entire religious system of ancient Israel. If you're going to understand the roots of Christianity, which is Judaism, where Jesus, the, the, the earthly Jesus, where He came from, what it is that gives the foreshadowing of Christ. If you understand Israel's religious system, you, the way you understand it is reading Leviticus. Here's a, a, another uh, why it's important to us. Leviticus actually provides the theological foundation for the atoning work of Jesus. Leviticus gives the foundation for what substitutionary atonement is. If you don't have substitutionary atonement, you don't have Christianity. It doesn't exist. So substitutionary atonement only makes sense because of Leviticus. If you don't have Leviticus, then Jesus died on the cross in the place of sinners. doesn't make any sense because we don't know about the sacrificial system. Another reason it's important to us, <clears throat> especially in our day, Leviticus demonstrates the importance the importance of holiness to God. We, we, um, 
We want to be obedient. We want to do things that honor God. But what Leviticus does is don't forget what is of primary importance to God is holiness. Why is it important to us? Well, I've said it several times. Leviticus contains the very words of God in direct speech. 38 times. Um, 38 times there's a little phrase that says, the Lord spoke and then gives what God said. 18 times uh, a little phrase says, God commanded and then gives the command. And then the last, um, last reason it's important to us Leviticus gives us the framework for the gospel. Leviticus draws out the frame. The New Testament fills it in. Leviticus gives us how the gospel actually works. You even hear it at the end of a sermon, or sometimes I'll stop in the middle of a sermon and say, I want to explicitly share the gospel. I'll start with God who is holy and then man who is a sinner, the problem is that God as holy, man as sinner, cannot be together. Leviticus gives us the framework of the solution that points us ultimately to Christ. Leviticus 20, verse 26. You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the people so that you shall be mine. I don't expect Leviticus to become your favorite book. I do hope you'll learn to love it for all the reasons we talked about tonight. Let me close with a word of prayer. I'm going to ask uh, Steve to come up and give some introduction. We need about a seven-minute business meeting. Seven minutes. I think Steve can pull it off. Let me pray for you guys. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for Leviticus. Thank you for your holiness. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the framework given to us in Leviticus that points us to our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that you help us to be obedient and to walk in holiness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.